Senior? Yes. Craig Dillon? Yes. Unanimous motion carried. Motion to approve. Okay, motion to approve agenda by Councilman Jumpenigo, second by Councilman Watkins. Go ahead, uh, Council Councilwoman Tapio, then Alverson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to add a discussion item to the agenda, and that would be the housing half program, because I got a lot of calls over the um, program and what's going on and why it's been um, suspended last week. So I think if we could put that on, add that to the agenda so we could get the information for the people. Thank you. Councilwoman Halverson. I was just going to second her motion. Oh, okay. Okay, so as a discussion item, so motion by Councilwoman Tapio, second by Councilwoman Hal Halverson. All for the vote. Wesley Hawkins, Sr. Oh. Jim Meeks. Yeah. Brian Jumpingo, Sr. Yes. Howard Rooks. Yes. Austin Watkins, Sr. Oh. Tyler Yellowboy. Yes. Wendell Youngman, Jr. Yes. Anna Halverson. Yes. Ella John Carlo. Yes. George Dreamer Jr. Yes. Robin Tapio. Yes. Tyler Lunderman. Yes. David Puyer. Yes. Sonia Little Hawk Weston. Uh -huh. Jackie Sears. Uh -huh. John Ray Gospair. John Steele Sr. Yes. Craig Dillon. Yes. Eighteen unanimous motion carried. Motion motion to co close the agenda. By Councilwoman Little Hawk Weston, second by Councilwoman Tapio. Call for the vote. Wesley Hawkins, Sr. Oh. Jim Meeks. Yeah. Brian Jumpinigo, Sr. Yes. Yeah. Howard Rooks. Yes. Austin Watkins, Sr. Tyler Yellowboy. Yes. Wendell Youngman, Jr. Yes. Anna Halverson. Yes. Ella John Carlo. Yes. George Dreamer, Jr. Yes. Robin Tapio. Yes. Tyler Lunderman. Yes. David Puyer. Yes. Sonia Little Hawk Weston. Uh, Jackie Sears. Uh huh. Conroy Gospair. Yes. John Steele Sr. Yes. Craig Dillon. 18 unanimous. Motion carried. So we left off at HHS uh, number six. I'll turn that over to the chair. Thank you. Um, resolution of the Gloucester Tribal Council of Gloucester Tribe approving the disenrollment for Miriam Chantal Motlow from the Gloucester Tribe membership. Whereas the Gloucester Tribe adopted its constitution and bylaws by referendum vote on December 14th, 1935, in accordance with section 16 of the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, 25 U.S.C. subsection 5123, and under Article 3 of the Constitution, the Gloucester Tribal Council is the governing body of the Gloucester Tribe. And whereas pursuant to the OST Constitution and bylaws of the Gloucester Tribe, the Oglala Sioux Tribal Council exercises legislative powers to enact and promulgate resolutions and ordinances. And whereas Article 2 of the OST Constitution authorizes the Tribal Council to adopt laws covering tribal membership, and whereas Article 4, Section 1J, of the OST Constitution empowers the Tribal Council to enact resolutions or ordinances not inconsistent with Article 2 concerning tribal membership. And whereas Miriam Chantal Motlow requests disenrollment from the Ogallah Sioux Tribe membership pursuant to OST Ordinance Number 18 03, Enrollment Code Article 6, Section 16.6.102, Relinquishment. And whereas by motion and vote on February 13, 2024, the OST Health and Human Services Committee recommended that the Tribal Council approve 
the request for relinquishment of Guadalupe tribal membership by disenrollment for Miriam Chantal Malo. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Guadalupe Tribal Council does hereby approve the request for relinquishment of Guadalupe tribal membership enrollment and all rights as a tribal member therein for Miriam Chantal Motlow, effective immediately. Motion to approve. Okay, motion by Councilman Jumpenigo. Second by Councilwoman Tapio. All for the vote. Wesley Hawkins, Sr. Oh. Jim Meeks. Yes. Ryan Jumpenigo, Sr. Yes. Howard Rooks. Yes. Austin Watkins, Sr. Tyler Yellowboy? No. Wendell Youngman Jr.? Yes. Anna Halverson? Yes. Ella John Carlo? Yes. George Dreamer Jr.? No. Robin Tapio? Yes. Tyler Lunderman? No. David Puyer? No. Sonia Little Hawk Weston? Uh -huh. Jackie Sears? Uh -huh. John Rigglesfair? Yes. John Steele Sr.? Yes. Craig Dillon? Fourteen yes, four no. Motion carried. Okay, so we're moving on to the next line item. Uh, would be finance, finance committee on the two thirds items. So I'll turn that over to the chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Resolution of the Oglala Sioux Tribal Council of the Oglala Sioux Tribe approving the Ghostberg Contracting Construction Contract for Construction Services under the HUD ICDBG B19 SR 46001 grant in the amount of $380,756. Whereas the Oglala Sioux Tribe is a sovereign tribal nation that has entered into treaties as the supreme law of the land with the United States government pursuant to the U.S. Constitution, Article 6 and is a signator of the Treaty of Fort Laramie of 1851 and the Treaty of Fort Laramie of 1858 and continues the nation-to-nation -nation relationship with the federal government. Councilman. Uh, that's what she gave me. Yeah. Number six. Number six right here. Wrong one, do-overs. Resolution of the Gulf Tribal Council of the Gulf Tribe approving the Lakota Nation's Disaster Res Resiliency Contract for the Project Management Services under the HUD ICDGB B19 SR46001 grant in the amount of 131600 So we did it already? Correct. Okay. We're at, we're at 1124. Whereas the Ogwazu tribe is a sovereign tribal nation that has entered into treaties as a supreme law of the land with the United States government pursuant to the U.S. Constitution, Article 6, and as a signator of the Treaty of Fort Laramie of 1851, the Treaty of Fort Laramie of 1868, and continues the nation-to-nation -nation relationship with the federal government. And whereas the Ogwazu tribe organized under Section 16 of the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, 25 U.S.C. subsection 5123, by adopting a federally approved constitution and bylaws, and under Article 3 of the Tribal Constitution, the Ogallister Tribal Council is the governing body of the tribe. And whereas Article 4, Section 1F, 1K, 1M, and 1W empower the Tribal Council to manage the economic affairs of the tribe, protect and preserve the property of the tribe, adopt laws governing the conduct of persons on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, and adopt laws protecting and promoting the health and general welfare of the Ogallister Tribe and its membership. And whereas the the Lakota Nation Disaster Resiliency, the LNDR, was formed in 2018 and, and received nonprofit status in 2019 to aid in meeting 
the imminent disaster and resi resiliency needs of the community and the people of the Ogallo Sioux tribe. And whereas the LNDR will provide the project management contract under the HUD ICDPG B19 SR 46001 grant for the contracted amount of 131,600. And whereas the LNDR will provide case management for those that applied for roofing assistance. And whereas the LNDR will identify 150, excuse me, 115 homes from across all nine districts for repair based on fair or impartial process. And whereas the OST Finance Committee has reviewed the bid for project management services and recommends the approval to award the contract to the L to LNDR. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the Ogallo Sioux Tribal Council does hereby approve Lakota Nation's disaster resiliency, the LNDR project management contract under the HUD ICDBG B19SR46001 grant in the amount of 131,600 as attached and incorporated as fully set herein. And be it further resolved that the tribal president, or in his absence, the tribal vice president, is authorized to execute the documents to effect, effectuate this contract. Sorry. Motion. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilman Yellowboy, second by Councilwoman Tapio. Secretary, call for the vote. Wesley Hawkins, Sr. Oh. Jim Meeks. Yes. Ryan Jumpinigo, Sr. Yes. Howard Rooks. Yes. Austin Watkins, Sr. Oh. Tyler Yellowboy. Yes. Wendell Youngman, Jr. Yes. Anna Halverson. Yes. Ella John Carlo. Yes. George Dreamer, Jr. Yes. Robin Tapio. Yes. Tyler Lunderman. David Puyer. Yes. Sonia Little Hawk Weston. Jackie Sears. Oh, uh huh. John Ray Goldsbear. John Still Sr. Yes. Craig Dillon. Yes. Eighteen unanimous motion carry. Okay, with that, well, uh, was that it, uh, Councilman? Just my other two thirds for later on. Okay, so we'll move on to the next agenda item. Uh, we'll turn it over to the chair, Van. Thank you, Chair. Secretary, could you read the ordinance? <laughs> ordinance of the Ogallala Sioux Tribal Council of the Ogallala Sioux Tribe amending ordinance number 13-17 by removing supervision and direction of the Ogallala Sioux Tribe's Tribal Historic Preservation Office THPO from the OST Natural Resource Agency and placing the supervision and direction of the THPO with the OST fifth member's office. Whereas the Ogallala Sioux Tribe is a sovereign tribal nation that has entered into treaties as a supreme law of the land with the United States government, pursuant to the U.S. Constitution Article 6 and its signatory to the Treaty of Fort Laramie of 1851, 1 stat 749, September 17, 1851, and the Treaty of Fort Laramie of 1868, 15 stat 635, April 29, 1868, and continues a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with the federal government. And whereas the Ogallala Sioux Tribe organized under Section 16 of the Indian Reorganization Act of 1935, 1934-25 USC subsection 5123 by adopting a federally approved constitution and bylaws and under article 3 of the federally approved constitution and bylaws and under sorry <laughs> of the tribe tribal constitution the Oglala Sioux Tribal Council is the governing body of the tribe and whereas article 4 section 1F 1K 1M and 1W empowers the tribal council to manage the economic affairs of the tribe 
protect and preserve the property of the tribe, adopt laws governing the conduct of persons of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, and adopt laws protecting and promoting the health and general welfare of the Oglala Sioux Tribe and its membership. And whereas the Oglala Sioux Tribe, Oglala Sioux Tribal Council did by ordinance number 1317 states that THPO is a standalone office and placed THPO under the supervision and direction of the OST Natural Resources Natural Resource Agency. And whereas the OST fifth member's office has been performing the function of the THPO for the past several years because of the vacancy in the THPO director's position, and whereas the Oglala Sioux Tribe believes that the function of the THPO can be better served and performed if the OST THPO is placed under the OST fifth member's office. And whereas the Oglala Sioux Tribe <clears throat> Land and Natural Resources Committee is a standing committee of the Oglala Sioux Tribal Council who did meet with a quorum present to conduct business on the 29th day of January 2024 and did adopt this ordinance and <clears throat> presentation to Tribal Council for their action. Now there <clears throat> therefore be it ordained that the Oglala Sioux Tribal Council does hereby approve based upon the recommendation of the OST Land and Natural Resources Committee to amend ordinance number 13-17 by removing the language which places the OST THPO under the supervision and direction of the OST Natural Resources Committee from ordinance number 13-17, placing the supervision and direction under the OST fifth member's office certification. Motion. Motion by Councilman Puyer, second by Councilman Watkins, Coffin, Councilman Hawkins. Okay, we got a question over here. Councilman Little Hawk Weston. I guess uh, I sit on land committee too, but I do know after that uh, meeting, I know I had uh, some uh, tribal members that were asking if this position is going to be advertised. I think they've been watching the uh, the advertisement before, I think, had a master's degree as a qualification, but it was been amended to a bachelor's, and some of our tribal members have bachelor's. So maybe a question for Justin, is this going to be advertised as job description? We will look at it. If we need a, if we need to put in a THPO officer, or if we get office manager, research specialist, you know, something like that, we're going to but we do, we are working on the job description because we had it set high for a master's de degree because that's when BIA accepts the concurrence letters and the reviews, the environmental reviews, they got to have at least a master's to sign that. Re so that's why uh, we put that in there before, but then, like we said, but we will be working on. I think it does need to, if you, especially if you have people out there that are looking at it and they feel that they would like to apply, I think that we should open that up for our tribal members. The other part of it is, I know we use Mike a lot at the housing, but you know, I think Mike too is uh, is good at what he does in that field of work. But if we're gonna put it under you as a supervision, you know, uh, I just wanted to know because the job description was amended from a master's to a bachelor's. So I think it does need to be advertised, you know, and I hope that you can uh, maybe think about that because we do have people that are watching for it and they do want to apply for it. Yeah, that that last that last round that they um, like I said, we advertised it, but some of the applicants didn't have the years requirement. They had the qualifications, but not the years. So we got to we got to work on it. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so go ahead, Councilwoman Tapio. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So is this a restructuring of the program? Is that what we're doing here? Chair, one of, one of the things is why we moved it out from up there too. So those that are on the land committee, and I guess the rest might as well know, it was taking a year to year and a half to do these culture or, or deals out in the field. And so when we moved it, I think a year ago, and put it under the supervision of a fifth member, then uh, things started to move right away with when they 
appointed Mr. Ketch is then some of the, from dragging the feet, some of them people even lost their loans because no field checks were being done. So that's one of the reasons why we're moving it because of the lack of supervision over there. Thank you. Yes. Um, also, I, I want to comment on also, you know, I attended a meeting down uh, last week. Um, and uh, I guess it was with the Air Force um, in Rapid City, or I guess Box Elder. And um, I was kind of uh, surprised myself that um, uh, none of the tribal leaders were uh, aware of our, our THPO um, um, or I should say all our THPOs uh, were unaware of some of the meetings. So I think we need to fill this position uh, ASAP. There are discussions that I don't, I've never gotten a report, so I don't know what's going on with, uh, with uh, where that's going. And I know there's some issues out there that need to be addressed and it, it, it does it does have a lot of field work in it and that need to be addressed. So, um, and it takes time to go out and do those kind of investigations. Um, so with that, I don't know if that's overwhelming for the fifth member, but as far as filling that position, it needs to be filled um, because uh, what I heard last week is, is, is to me is not acceptable. Um, as far as uh, uh, getting those reports, because it seems like they're already uh, in a different stage and and tribal leaders had no uh, idea this was uh, some of the things happening. So go ahead, Councilman uh, Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, after you went to attend other business there, the, they just, they were discussing this and they're going to notify all the tribal chairmen, all the tribal chairmen, when they're going to set this up. They're going to notify all the tribal chairmen. Okay. Oh. Well, thank you for that update. Go ahead, Councilman. Still. Yes, uh, Justin. Tribe worked very hard and had to fight to get this program. Before then, the federal departments all required a historic preservation office input before they did any construction or did any business and the tribes didn't have an office so the state historic preservation office performed those functions that state historic preservation office thinks of us as prehistoric as in one of their education deals up in the black hills they had the teepee rings down as prehistoric and the sod houses down as part of history. But we need to get this office functioning to uh, perform their duties for all those federal monies that require it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Go ahead, Hefner. Yeah, thank you, uh, John. And to add to that, you know, all these all this other infrastructure money that Biden has put out, they're putting up all these big um, wind farms and solar panels in our in our territory. So you know, a lot of times we have our tribal cultural specialists out there surveying those sites and looking for those cultural sites. So last year we had people working in Wyoming, North Dakota, and Montana. So once they once they have these big significant finds, then they send the letters to the THPOs, and we'll go out and make a make a determination on what to do remediate or so you know we're trying to we're doing the best we can to keep up with all these projects and we do have a handful of tcs that we do deploy out every summer thank you okay go ahead councilwoman halverson so i have a question on here it says that <clears throat> The Oglala Sioux Tribal Council will reaffirm three-member Tribal Historic Preservation Advisory Council. Is that council already in place, or are you going to be set in a council in place, and who um, chooses that council? There is a there is an advisory council in place now. 
that Tom appointed or Tom brings appointed, but we're going to go back and look at that also. So will those also be um, up for advertisement too? I'm I'm trying to do, I did some research on how it was really advertised out and it seemed like back there was no really nothing in the records on how it was advertised. So we're going to have to relook at that and put out letters of interest and make sure that we get, because we, um, as we're going forward, you know, we have all these, all these projects coming up and we need, we need to really strengthen that PHPO office and, you know, working with it for the last year and prior to that, from my, my first term, I did a lot of that work also. So it's one thing that we need. There's a lot of stuff. We also need to look at the THPO um, guidelines too. Okay, any more questions? We're gonna run the vote. Secretary, call for the vote. Wesley Hawkins, Sr. Oh. Jim Meeks? Yes. Ryan Jumping Eagle, Sr. Yes. Howard Rooks? Yes. Austin Watkins, Sr. Oh. Tyler Yellowboy? Yes. Wendell Youngman, Jr. Yes. Anna Halverson? Yes. Ella John Carlo? Yes. <clears throat> George Dreamer, Jr. Robin Tapio? Yes. Tyler Lunderman? Yes. David Puyer? Yes. Sonia Lillahawk Weston? Uh, Jackie Sears? Uh huh. John Ray Goldspare? Yes. John Steele Sr.? Yes. Craig Dillon? Seventeen yes, one not voting. Motion carry. Wopila Taka. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you. Okay, so next agenda item is a president's report. I believe it is being just passed out for January and February. Go ahead. A motion to approve the report. Motion by Councilwoman Tapio. Second by Councilman Rooks. Secretary, call for the vote. Wesley Hawkins, Sr. Oh. Jim Meeks? Yes. Ryan Jumping Eagle, Sr. Yes. Howard Rooks? Yes. Austin Watkins, Sr. Tyler Yellowboy? Yes. Wendell Youngman, Jr. Yes. Anna Halverson? Ella John Carlo? Yes. George Dreamer, Jr. Robin Tapio? Yes. Tyler Lunderman? Yes. David Puyer? Yes. Sonia Lillahawk Weston? Uh. Jackie Sears? Uh -huh. John Ray Goldspare? Yes. John Still Sr.? Yes. Craig Dillon? Sixteen yes, two not voting. Motion carried. Go ahead, Councilman Puyer. Chair, the next time there's a meeting with the Air Force, I'd like to be notified because we have some Air Force retained area here on the res, and we need to get that turned back over to the tribe. So if there's ever a meeting, I'd like to be informed. Thank you. Yes, uh, I would too. Uh, you know, the, the Standing route chairman was uh, informed me of that meeting and uh, requested for Oglala OST to be there to support. So I showed up at last minute. So that's how I found out. Oh, okay, recognize Councilman Ross at 1114. Uh -huh. Weird. <laughs> yeah. 
did that cover both January and February? It did? Yes. Okay. They're both reports, two reports there. Okay, so moving on to next agenda item, treasurer. Um, thank you. And good morning, everybody. Bo is bringing down your packet. It's basically what I gave you guys in finance. Um, I did get a letter this morning regarding the travel stuff. I have the amendment included in the, um, Bo, can you bring that packet down now? They have it on upstairs. So, but I did get a couple of letters regarding the travel. So I guess we'll go over that first. Um, one is a letter. It doesn't say who it's from. It just says concerned OST employees regarding the payment, repayment of travel. Um, yay. As we discussed last week, the um, attorney did draft the ordinance to amend the financial management policy regarding travel repayment. Um, the, the second memo I received that I didn't send copies out to you is um, a memo from an administrator of a program and she does recognize that it was her responsibility to submit these reports in a timely ma manner and she waited until the end of the year to submit so she's requesting that the travel deductions come from her salary because it was her responsibility one of the um, program administrators. So she's requesting that it come from her, her pay because the employees did have the reports in on time. She just didn't file them until the end of the year. <clears throat> but I'll, I'll read the ordinance that was brought forth. Ordinance of the Oglala Sioux Tribal Council of the Oglala Sioux Tribe amending the financial management manual adopted by ordinance number 0913 as amended to modify payroll deductions for outstanding travel authorizations. Whereas the Oglala Sioux Tribe is a sovereign tribal nation that has entered into treaties as the supreme law of the land with the United States government pursuant to the OST Constitution, Article 6, and is a statutory, is a signatory of the Treaty of Fort Laramie of 1851, 1 Statute 749, and Fort, Treaty of Fort Laramie 1868, 15 Statute 635, and continues a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with the federal government. And whereas the Oglala Sioux Tribe organized under Section 16 of the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934 by adopting a federally approved constitution and bylaws, <clears throat> and under Article 3 of the Tribal Constitution, the Oglala Sioux Tribal Council is the governing body of the tribe. And whereas Article 4, Sections 1F, 1K, 1M, and 1W empower the Tribal Council to manage the economic affairs of the tribe, protect and preserve the property of the tribe, <clears throat> excuse me, adopt laws governing the conduct of persons on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and adopt laws protecting and promoting the health and general welfare of the Oglala Sioux Tribe and its membership. And whereas the Tribal Council adopted the Financial Management Manual by Ordinance Number 09-13 on March 13th, 2009, and amended it in ordinance numbers 12-05, 14-10, 14-15, and 17-27, 
And whereas the Finance Committee reviewed the Financial Management Manual on February 29, 2024, and now recommends an additional amendment to the Financial Management Manual set forth herein. Now, therefore, be it ordained that the Oglala Sioux Tribal Council does hereby approve the recommendation and amends Chapter 23, Section 23-116 of the Financial Management Manual of the Oglala Sioux Tribe to read in its entirety as follows, with additions indicated by underline and red, face, red typeface and deletions in strike through. The traveler must report, the traveler's report, it should just be travel. The travel report must be submitted when the off-reservation travel is completed. It must be supported by airline tickets, charter invoices, car rental invoice, original hotel, motel receipts, and other documentation as may be required. The refund may be paid with a money order, payroll deduction, for, or payroll deduction from the traveler's wages. The traveler has two weeks after traveling to submit the travel report. An employee elected official must repay all outstanding travel authorizations before another travel authorization is issued, no exceptions. Travel reports should be submitted to the accounts payroll department and recorded with, with the date received. Failure to provide a travel report within 30 days. That paragraph above should be 30 days. The traveler has 30 days. Yep. Failure to provide a travel report within 30 days after travel is complete period, oh, comma, complete, voids the employee's right for any travel reimbursement. The forfeited travel reimbursement will be repaid through the payroll deduction process. Travel reports must be submitted by the program director or designee to the accounts payable department, which will record the date received any dispute over outstanding travel must be addressed in writing by the program director, elected officials, and given to the treasurer for a final decision. Only the treasurer of the, of the Oglala Sioux Tribe will authorize any repayment of travel that has been deducted from an employee's elected official's salary check. The payments for outstanding travel authorizations will be payroll deducted as follows. In equal increments of 15% of the total owed through payroll deductions from the employee elected officials bi-weekly payroll checks, no exceptions. And all the rest was taken out. Further be it ordained, the foregoing amendment shall take effect immediately and be it further ordained that this ordinance shall take effect immediately and shall supersede, repeal, and replace all prior inconsistent laws of the Oglala Sioux Tribe certification. And this was brought forth because I was um, approached um, by the travel director who has in previous years, submitted reports <clears throat> of outstanding travel, and um, she tried to have it deducted from the employees previously, and the past treasurer would not allow them to. So it's built up for several years, and um, now it's come to this. Like I said, we do have one administrator who is requesting that the amounts be deducted from her payroll because she realizes that she was responsible for the reports being late. And, and I will approve that. 
Go ahead, Councilman Boyer. So with that being said on that part there, so that person is gonna do all of them under that program? There, there's only two travel reports that were outstanding for 2022. And um, they had submitted to her prior to the deadline, like within a week of their travel. And she just did not bring them to the office until December. Okay. So what about those travel things that the past treasurer waived? Are we going to go back and do them? Or how is there any documentation that those are waived? Or how, how are we going to do this? They were just accumulated in a binder. There's like three binders, one for 2019, one for 2020, one for 2021, and one for 2022. And Sam has just completed 2023. And that's in a big binder too. No, so if he waived those ones in the past, then are we gonna we we can't go back? They weren't actually waived. He I mean, just told her not to deduct them. Okay, okay, thanks. Councilwoman Carlo. Thank you. Good morning, Cora. What is the amount? I mean, if one individual is gonna pay for all of that, what is the amount on that? Um, well, if this passes, it's 15% of her net income. What is owed? She just has two travel reports that are outstanding in her program. Um, one is 1200 and she didn't submit the other one, but she said she would pull it if the, her request is approved and deduct it. Councilman Goldsberg, were you done, Councilwoman? Thank you, Chair. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, Cord, do you have a list for this year? Past the artist administration who went over? For 2023? Um, I don't, but I can get you one from Sam. It'll take a bit because they're just in binders by program. Okay, thank you. Councilwoman Halverson. Um, I have a question on the funds that were used for the travel. Are they federal funds, indirect 638 funds? Are they reimbursable cost funds? Or, you know, how is that gonna affect those funding sources? Any Anything that's reimbursed that is taken out of an employee's paycheck will go back into that program. So, whether it's federal funds or indirect costs or general fund or whatever program it comes from, whatever's paid back will be going back into the program. Because it, it doesn't matter because we have our own policy and it's approved. It's a certified system. That's how we get our grants. They, they look at our policy and make sure that we have everything covered. So wherever the money is deducted from will be where the money goes back to. Yeah, because on that finance meeting, like it says, we went over the financial management um, last week, but was that after I left for the funeral or because I thought we were going to bring it back to finance committee? It was after you left. Yeah, and and it was just the, tra the reporting section changing from... Um, three payments into the 15%. Because oh. three payments on a $1,200 travel is $400 a payday. And if it's a $500 travel, then it says to deduct in one lump sum. And that's a big bite out of someone's payroll. But if you make $12 an hour and you're paying 15% of your income, that's like 50 bucks, which is easier to swallow than $500. So the employees aren't gonna be waived those, right? Because I think at that meeting you said that it wasn't 
you know, no exceptions. So it's just lowering that amount down to 15%. Yeah, just lowering the payback amount to, instead of three big payments of $400, it would be <clears throat> like 15% of their income, whatever that happens to be. If it's $12 an hour that you make, then your payment would be about $50 a payday. Which will take longer to pay back, but it's still going to get paid back. Councilman Steele. Yes, Cora, this is a, it's a two-way street. If they do turn in their travel reports and receipts, sometimes the traveler gets a refund. And if they don't turn uh, a travel report in, they get charged the motel receipt, the gas receipt, if they don't turn that receipt in, even though they actually did pay those expenses on their travel, if they don't turn the receipt in, they get charged. And so this is a very delicate uh, issue where sometimes that traveler might not owe. It's because somebody lost their receipt. Or sometimes they are supposed to get a refund if they turn in a full travel report. And so it's difficult to decide who owes what when. Just take 15% of their salaries. Uh, I don't know if that's fair. Councilman Yellowboy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just um, I, I was sitting here and I was receiving some questions. <clears throat> If the 15%, if this is approved of today, are there travel restrictions put in place until it's paid off or are they able to still continue going to the trainings and meetings and so forth? You know, there, there's a lot of programs and, and it does say that until it's dealt with, there will be no more travel. But if a person is paying back on a, outstanding travel they should be allowed to go to travel because most of our programs meet with funding agencies that's what most of their travel is for okay that, that was just one of the questions and and you know i do agree with 15 percent um because i too was getting calls about somebody getting four dollars on their paycheck when they took the whole paycheck to pay that back so it really puts a burden on on the employees and their families. So, um, Mr. Chair, I'll make the motion to approve. Okay, we have a question over here, uh, Councilman Dillon. Yeah, you know, this is kind of a catch-22 for the employees, especially when they submit them, if they have to submit them to the chief of staff or somebody, they should have a time stamp on it, a date stamp, and then hold that person accountable because you know, if, if it stops with the, the director of that program and the employee submits it, then somebody other than the employee has to be accountable for those dollars because that's just being fair. So can we amend this ordinance to say that, that all travel reports will have a date stamped on them and when it was submitted so the, the employee doesn't get kicked in the butt for something they didn't do? And I think that's really important we include that on there because we need to safeguard our employees. It, um, <clears throat> excuse me. It actually, in the third paragraph, it says that travel reports should be submitted to accounts payable department and recorded with the date received. So if in the next paragraph, maybe travelers, that should be added there. Travel travel reports must be submitted to program directors or designees with a date stamp. Yes, because that'll protect our employees then. Because a lot of someone losing paperwork when you submit it and you're get, having to pay for it is wrong. Okay, could you look at that? Not really. I'll add it. This is Georgette. I'll add it in red and submit it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, Councilwoman Little Hawk question. Oh, I was, I was okay. Go ahead, Councilwoman Sears. 
Yeah, I was just reading that part here about the um, treasure to authorize repayment of the travel or anything. I, you know, I think that when you're talking about the, the previous um, treasure, that they're kind of put this all out of whack, I think, given that treasure so much, um, re, you know, authorization to stop things or not allowing things. I think we need to emphasize more of this on the travel office, letting her do her job. Because if somebody's telling them not to submit this or that or stop this, that's what put us in this predicament. So we gotta have some checks and balances here. I mean, myself as an employee, I don't wanna depend on somebody that's not gonna you know, submit my reports. I would want that opportunity to go up there directly and say, here, here's my travel. Give them that option instead of waiting and say, you have to give it to the director or somebody, you know? I think that that would be something that I would have that option to do. That would be protecting your employees so that they know when they did their travel, they handed it in, they, they, put that responsibility on the higher ups, which didn't happen. So they got, you know, they have to pay it back. So I think something like that needs to be uh, put in there because I think that they should have that option too. And, and I totally agree with that. And that was my recommendation to a few of the um, assistants that came in to do different appeals. Because if they're not letting their employees be responsible for their own travel, then who do you hold accountable? Do you hold that administrator accountable or that assistant accountable? Or do you hold that employee accountable? I mean, because ultimately we're all adults. And if, if we say that we have to submit our receipts, then we should be allowed to submit those receipts. So I, I would, and I would totally agree, you know, for programs and everything else, I would rather have the comptroller there than myself. But somebody has to be the bad guy. And everybody would prefer that the bad guy be. And I think there needs to be language that protects our travel clerk to do her job maybe directly working with the programs <clears throat> instead of going through the treasurer. Get your get those notices out to the programs, you know, reminders. That way she's covering herself that she did let them know. So I think there's gotta be some kind of language in there, you know, for the travel clerk or whoever does the that Sammy, her position. Yeah. And and I agree with that too. And that was my first argument with Dean. You know, if we have to hold people accountable, then why, how come we have stuff here from so long ago? You know, if they have 30 days, then we should have 30 days to respond. So, but I would think that in that one, two, three, four, fifth paragraph, if you would add in Only the travel clerk of the Oglala Sioux Tribe will authorize any repayment of travel that has been deducted from an employee elect employees or elected officials salary check. And then you can add in there that appeals can be filed to the comptroller and treasurer. Because there always has to be an appeal process. Okay, uh, Councilman Ghostbear. Okay, Councilman Yellowboy. Thank you. Um, so we're talking about putting lists out or getting notices out and covering, you know, making sure our travel director has that protection, but is there something 
or is there a possible way to get these programs the list that way the outstanding travel or whatever and that way they can notify their employees because i mean it's it's not fair that here's the payroll and then boom you get your payroll check taken and then find out later on that again the scenario where they gave it to their admin assistant admin assistant didn't turn it in on time and so forth so just okay a question let me go back a little bit in november they did a deduction and um there were so many people there was like 600 employees who had travel deducted and so i told them well let's pay that back and start over after christmas so everybody got paid back that travel that was deducted and then i put a memo out and the memo said you have 30 days to file an appeal and to bring in any outstanding receipts 30 days which was december 20th out of those 600 employees do you know how many appeals i got 14. 14 appeals and it's the same email that's used to send out admin leave. It's the same email that's used to send out the holiday notices. It's the same email that's used to send out any type of notice. So nobody can say they didn't get the email because they all got the email. And so this isn't something that we just took lightly, that was just sprung upon everybody. It's been ongoing since November, and in some cases since 2019. And previously, once it was brought up, then it was stopped. But we all talk about accountability, and we all talk about being fair. And if we're going to have policies, we should follow them. And if we're not going to follow them, then maybe we need to make a motion to not follow policies. But we have to start somewhere because it's it's baby steps. And, and change always hurts. It's not easy for anybody. It was hard for me two weeks ago. I had an administrator administrative assistant come in and she cried in my office because she had 60 employees that she hadn't filed an appeal for. And that really bugged me. That was, that was why I asked Dean, how do we fix this? And he's the one who suggested the 15% because it's easier to do than trying to make someone pay a third of a twelve hundred dollar travel. So, my next question is: When the deductions are done, they have a accurate system of to when they shut it off and they're all caught up, right? Okay, I, I I'll visit with you afterwards. Yeah. Councilwoman Tapio. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to yield the floor to one of my community members. She has a comment. Yes, let's uh, recognize Councilman. Hello, my Hello. name is Pigeon Baker. I'm the director of the OST Child Care and Development Program. Uh, and 42. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so my name is Pigeon. I'm the director of the OST Child Care and Development Program. And I want to address you as not only a community member, a tribal member, but also a program director of one of the largest tribal programs that we have. And I, I want to first you know, thank you for you know, hearing the situation, hearing the issues, but I want to be here mostly to take accountability. This is my fault. My employees should not have to pay because I wasn't paying attention. Me, I, I know, I, I accept that. Um, I'm extremely sorry, I couldn't, I didn't sleep. I mean, you could probably look at my eyes and tell I haven't slept very well for a while. And, you know, I'm, I'm here to ask you if you would consider 
um, extending the deadline for the waivers because that would fix a lot. I mean, if we're gonna stop and take a look and say, okay, what happened? What can we do? What happened was I didn't, I didn't see it. Um, yeah, it came out in the email, but I mean, there's so many emails that come out and we, we kind of look and see what we, we, we can pay attention to. And a lot of times if, if there's only 14 out of 600 that submitted, there's a, something happened. So there was a breakdown in communication, something happened. I don't know what it was, but for me, it's me. I take responsibility. That was me, I, my fault. Um, if we can just stop and say, okay, so if we get a stop and look at the policies, you know, and change them and make them better for our people, you know, let's let's do the same for our employees. Let's extend the waiver, you know, give them time. Cause I know a lot of ours, and, and I'm, I can only speak for my program, but a lot of ours are turned in, but they were turned in late. And some of them justifiably should be repaid. Um, I'm not gonna argue that point, but yeah, if they need to be repaid, yeah, they'll repay them. But for the bulk that were late because of me, um, my employees shouldn't have to suffer for, for my neglect of duty. I will accept whatever consequence um, that I need to accept because I'm sorry I did that. You know, no excuses, no, nothing I could say would bring back the fact that I didn't pay attention. Um, you know, I don't know what else to say except I'm getting really emotional because I know my people and I know some of them have new babies, house payments, car payments. You know, if, if we're gonna give an opportunity to FAO to fix the problem, then let's you know, work with our employees and, and extend the waiver and, and let them get those in so that you know, let's all start new. Let's all start fresh. Let's all you know, okay, something happened, something broke, let's fix it. Let's fix it together as a whole team. You know, you and us and our employees, you know. And so internally, what I after I wrote my um letter, I did do an internal audit. I, I said, okay, what happened here internally? How do we fix this? So I came up with internal policies for our program so that it won't happen again. So I fixed it internally. So I just want you to understand that, you know, it's not the employee's fault. They shouldn't really suffer for this. It, you know, go after me because it's me. And maybe other, you know, the travel clerk who, why are we going back to 19? 19 should have been in 20, 20 and 21, 21 and 22, and 22 should have been in 23. Beside the point, you know, let's all just stop, not blame each other, but let's fix it together. Question, go ahead, Councilwoman Tapley. Okay, uh, okay, thank you, Pigeon. Um, I would like to hear from the treasurer on um, how this waiver would impact the tribe and how it'll impact what we're trying to do here, because I think that's kind of important. I'm not really understanding how she's on. Oh, you're not done? Yeah, I did just have one more point and I can only speak for our program, but I did make some calls and I found out that our 19 and 20 and 21, 22 reports were submitted. The only ones that we can go back and um, do anything with is the 21 and 22 because the 19 and 20 accounts are fully closed out, can't touch them again, can't open them again. So would have to do a full amendment. So if those travels came out of 19 or 20, then we have to open those back up. And if we have to repay them, those get repaid to the treasury, not to the program for those two years for 19 and 20. So I just wanna make that a point as well. Okay, Councilwoman Halverson. Oh, go ahead, Robin. I'll go ahead. It, it depends on what the waiver you're trying to do is. If you're, if you want to waive all of the payroll deductions for all of the employees for 19, 20, and 21, that's totally up to you guys. If you want to start with 22 because not all the programs are fully closed out, then that's fine as well. But it's totally up to you because we had a policy in place that just was not followed. Thank you. Councilwoman Halverson. You know, so a few few comments, few questions. You know, I think if this is gonna pass, I think all employees need to be treated at a fair process. 
and that waiver needs to be considered for all. So it's like how many employees are getting waivered and how many employees are being held accountable for what they've done. Um, if this waiver is passed, it needs to go to every single employee. Um, it just sounds like a neglect of duty. And I agree with you, Cora. I think, you know, you're following the policy, you're holding people accountable, and that's not easy. It's not easy to follow these policies, but you're right. You know, these policies are in a place for a reason. And, um, you know, another concern that I have on travel is how, um, how are people being accountable on if they're actually going to these places of tribal business on tribal dollars? Um, how do you hold those people accountable? How do you hold the employees that are out to different areas um, make sure that they're actually there, you know, it just, um, and my most important question is, um, how do we go backwards on tribal ordinance, um, once it's accepted? And maybe that's for our lawyers to, um, look at is because I thought like, if you pass something in an ordinance, it doesn't go backwards. It goes forward. Just like when we extended our travel amount. Um, last year, that was a big question on how do we even go backwards. So a lot of these questions probably need to be answered by um, our attorney, because um, I just don't see how that happens. Councilwoman Little Hawk Weston. You know, um, I do think our attorneys probably need to weigh in, or maybe Cora, you had uh, met with the attorneys on this, but. You know, the way I look at it is that, you know, we as council make policy, we pass it by ordinance or resolution, but again, you know, it comes back to uh, not only the employees, but it comes back to even us as a tribe upstairs, FAO, you know, we have to take accountability too. And going back three years, I just cannot see that you know, going back to 2019 and 2020, you know, every year they tell us that everything ends uh, December 1st. Fiscal year ends, our calendar year ends, and we move forward. But now it seems like we're going back because uh, we could look at COVID, but you know, we can't use COVID no more for excuses. We use COVID too many times about, uh, excuse uh, that because of COVID, I couldn't do this or do that. You know, I'm getting text messages from this, uh, from uh, one of the programs that did submit their travel receipts to that administrator. Now they're very concerned because, you know, their, their amounts are quite high and they feel they shouldn't have to repay that back, you know, because in their probably internal uh, policies, everything was to given to that person. And that person was to do the travel reports, submit it upstairs, and it wasn't done. So now they shouldn't be held accountable for that. I don't think they should, you know, but if we were doing our job uh, back in 2019 and moving forward, maybe we wouldn't be where we're at today, you know, but everyone has a job to do. And that's why I've been saying that in our travel office, we only got two employees upstairs working on doing all of this, not just for the program, but with the tribal council too. So we can't get out of it either. You know, us as tribal council need to understand that too, that we need to submit our travel reports to uh, Sammy or Tabitha, you know, in a timely manner. And if we don't, then uh, it goes to payroll deduction, you know, or gets paid back. But again, you know, with everything going on, you know, it seemed like they were just being really overwhelmed upstairs to the point where look at how far back we're going. 2019 to all the way up to 2023 now. But I really believe it's not up to, it's not the employee's fault, the ones that did submit their travel reports to where they were supposed to. And I think that it's hard to say, but sometimes as, and I'm glad uh, Pigeon came forward to say that I'll take accountability for this. You know, as directors, you need to take accountability for your your program, you know, I've been a director. There's some of us in this circle know that how we should be managing our programs. So if employees are not paying or doing what they're supposed to do, it comes back on the director themselves. 
But like you said, there's administrative assistants not doing what they should do. And now the people under them have to be held accountable for that. And they're not happy about it. So I hope we come to a resolution on, on this. And I think uh, I, we're gonna learn from it, but 15% of their net uh, uh, pay is probably a lot of them maybe don't even get a big check. And you're taking 15% of uh, what they're making in order to pay it back. So is there gonna be a breakdown like how we originally had it on the financial management manual? Let's say if you had a thousand dollars that came up that you owe back, is there gonna be a breakdown that shows that 15%? Um, that it's just 15 flat of their net because right now the policy reads that if it's um, over 500, it's in three payments. So if, like I said, if your travel is 1200, you have to pay $400 a payday. And if you're, if it's 500 or less, then you have to pay that in one shot. And it's easier to pay $50 than it is to pay 500 or whatever. Councilman Jumpin' Eagle. Thank you, Chair. Um, so there's an appeal process. I know Tyler talked about that, Cora. So you had these ones that came in and they appealed it and you made a decision that probably wasn't in their favor because we had had an employee here on finance Thursday, you know, asking finance committee to reverse your appeal. Why do we have an appeal process and a decision's made and then we get here we are today. You see what I mean? Um, a decision was made, and I'm just talking about, you know, and, and you say that, but that, that is just my question on the appeal process. I mean, why do we have it if you make a, a decision on an appeal and then it comes here to council because the appeal isn't in the favor of the person? I, I'm going to give my personal opinion on this. You know, we have appeal processes for everything because everybody has the right to appeal a higher decision. But everybody is so used to coming to committee or coming to council and getting their boss or their whoever, their decision overturned in their favor because it's political, because it's easier to come here and say, let me get my way. When they know the process, the process is there. And I feel bad too. You know, I don't think it's fair that I took this position, so now I have to follow policy for everybody. I would rather be sitting there saying, no, let's not make them pay. Cause that's easier. It is. It's easier. And when you're trying to hold people to a policy that was made, how do you do it? How do you do it when you're doing what the policy says, but because, because of whatever, People don't want to follow that policy because it's not in their favor. We just get rid of the policy and say we don't need to follow anything anymore? Or do we start following the policy? It's hard. These are the hard decisions that we have to make every day. But we have to start somewhere. So oh, I'm not done yet, Chair. So in, in that... And you reported to us in the policies, it says in that appeal, the treasurer's decision is final, right? So do we need, and I, I, I won't even, I won't even go there. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Councilman Goldsberg. Thank you, Chair. You know, Cor, I want to thank you for coming out, trying to be, be trying to be, make, hold people accountable transparency 
also you said that you know people don't like change and we got to start somewhere and you know i don't think honestly it's fair that some of these people have to pay it back because i could think of a few people that need to start paying back money right now really i do but this process cora i guess getting a few texts is it going to be fair across the board if we go over this route it, it would be fair across the board. I, I don't think the policy right now is fair because of the amounts. The amounts are large. They're very large. And to be to pay 15% of your income is a lot easier than trying to pay 400 or 500 or in some cases even 800. It's hard to pay that much at once, but it's easier to pay 15% of your net income than it is to pay a full amount. And it's still going to get paid. It's going to take a little longer, but it's still going to get paid. And it's following the policy. And the policy, I believe, with the 15% is fair to all of our tribal employees. Thank you, Cora. Thank you, Chair. Councilman Sears. Yeah, I think um, earlier, Cora, you mentioned that um, email went out to everybody on that server, or the email group one that you send out, and they have no excuses. But I don't think all the employees are on that email because you know we've been told that they never received that from their directors or whoever supervisors that get these emails. And that's where I see the problem because these employees never got that 30 day chance to submit their um, receipts. And I'm sure they will. And they're saying that they do have receipts but they weren't told because you know, because of the, uh, they didn't get uh, proper information from their supervisors on up. So we're getting a lot, of, a lot of text messages with from our employees out there saying that they wish that they got the email because they would have su submitted their paperwork. And so, you know, when you're talking about a waiver, you know, I'm not in favor of waivers, but you know, you have that discretion as a treasure to allow time for these employees that never got the email you know they're that's that's what i think the whole thing is um these concerns are coming from is the ones that never seen the email given that opportunity so i just wanted to bring that forward councilman lunderman thank you chair um i just want to start off by saying uh, good morning to everyone out there um cora thank you for for coming here today and bringing a report and um you know thank you for your work and i'm confident in your work um but you know on this discussion you know i'm i'm all for policy but you know what it's 2024 guys and we're sitting here talking about things clear back to 2019 and you know these things root back that far back then i mean it's not fair to the employees that it should have been followed clear back in then 2019 2020 2021 2022 2023 it should have been followed then but to bring it up now i mean like i said i'm i'm for following policy but i just don't think it's fair you know it's 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 not fair so i mean i don't know i'm i'm trying to i guess think of a solution too you know what 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 do we do i mean something that far back I mean, it should have been dealt with then, you know, but, you know, I, I guess our treasure in the past wasn't, wasn't um, following the policy, I guess. So, but, you know, I, we just need to figure out a solution here. You know, I don't know if we need to, you know, send it back to Paul, uh, back to finance and, and try to work out. I mean, you know, I don't like to go into tabling motions or you know anything like that you know because you want to conduct business and get things done but i mean what do we do what do we do so thank you 
Uh, just a reminder that uh, the lunch is here, so uh, keep that in mind. Uh, Councilman Dillon. I'd like to yield the floor to Mr. Jacobs back there. Three minutes, Chuck. Thank you, Mr. Dillon. Thank you, uh, Tribal Council, and Mr. President. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Dillon. Um, thank you, Mr. Or Tribal Council, Mr. President. Um, I'm, I thought I'd come down and lend my two cents to this because um, this issue, the issue is uh, I had a trip report that was overdue by two days and the last uh, treasurer denied me. Um, and so I had to pay a $2,400 um, travel receipt or report back in a three payments. And so that was $800 a, a shot. So that was tough. Um, because I was two days overdue, then I accepted that because that was the policy. And this last particular issue, um, CORE is facing now with 600 employees um, going back this many years. Um, and some of this money uh, should have been closed out already. And, and I don't know that you can pull uh, 23 or $24 out and pay uh, those liabilities back that far. Um, that's one issue. The other issue, another issue is um, uh, the the appeal that they gave us to uh, that 30 day appeal process. Um, I responded and put in uh, my appeal on time. And again, they took money out of my check. So I guess I was denied. So there's a, a, a if there's an appeal process, then uh, we need to, or you guys need to install or instill uh, the responsibility of whoever that appeal is going to, to respond and let them know what their decision was. In my particular instance, um, we it was an $1,800 travel back in 21, I think. Um, I submitted my reports on time to the chief of staff office. Um, my dates on my reports and the date of my travel clerk's report all reflected that I was within the time limit, but the um, travel clerk upstairs put a, a timestamp on it uh, two months later at the end of December. Anyway, the point is we need a uh, stamp, a date stamp at every junction that we submit something to. So if it sits there and doesn't get somewhere on time, then our the employees won't be liable for it. That administrator is that administrator's fault that it didn't get done. And so um, if the, the the date stamps are important, that's what we found out from our where we're sitting at the, in this organization. And the appeal process um, needs to be whenever a decision is made, the employees need to be notified what that decision was. Um, and that's, I don't know, it doesn't seem like that's not too much to ask. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to let uh, uh, Ms. Bicro come back up here. You had a question. Okay, I do want to address the issue of appeals um, because I did appeal, um, and I'm sorry, Cora, but I do have to just go forward with this. So when my staff brought my appeal, so... The, the letter came in in November, which we all, we all obviously missed. And so I did write an appeal letter and my staff, uh, my assistant brought the appeal letter down and walked in and, and Cora said, is that from Pigeon? And she said, yes. And Cora said, no. She said, well, you didn't read it. She said, no, it's no. And so she said, well, are you gonna read it? And so um, at that time, yeah, you did take it and read it and then just still said, it's no, but you know, there was the appeal, appeal, there was no actual, if we're going to do a fair appeal, then there should be some sort of consideration. And like we said, there's really, it, appeals are always fair. There should always be somewhere to go, somewhere, someone that can hear it again and say, okay, wait now. So yeah, I agree or I don't agree. And here's why. But that was my experience with my appeal. It was, was, wasn't even considered. When was it tendered? Um, yeah, so it was an appeal. It wasn't the actual, um, the actual 
request for a waiver. So an, a, a request for a waiver would be their initial action. An appeal is, okay, so I'm asking for a reconsideration. That's an appeal. So my appeal was turned in February 22nd, which is technically what you would consider an appeal, right? Or am I wrong? So we missed initial action. I asked for reconsideration, which is an appeal. So Did you want to I'm, respond yeah, to that? No, I don't want to be, I kind of understand uh, where they're coming from, you know, but at the same time, you know, um, you know, what we're hearing is that a lot of these employees never got the email. A lot of them could have appealed it. If the, the administrator or the director or whoever got the email, because the email goes out not to those employees, it goes out to the directors of all the programs. So, you know, I'm going to make a motion if one, uh, once you run this other one, if this other one, I like, I'm going to make a motion that we extend for 30 days for this waiver, you know, to allow for these employees even to submit their travel reports. You know, a lot of them were getting text messages from some of these programs and they're saying, you know, we submitted our travel reports, but you know, it's not our fault that the person that was in charge of it should have submitted it to the travel clerk, but didn't happen. But we never seen that email. Otherwise, as employees, we could have appealed it. So, you know, I like to make, I'm gonna make that motion to just allow for 30 more days for a waiver so that these uh, employees could, you know, either uh, submit their, um, their receipts or their appeals, whatever it may be. But, you know, this is just going on and on. And I think we're just getting too many phone calls. Our text message is actually from employees. So, you know, I understand where Cora is coming from on this, but that concerns me too, is going back, clear back to 2019, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we're just, we're in 2024. Actually, the tribe's a calendar year. We're in 2024, but we're going back clear to 2019 to make these employees pay back, you know? So that's just my uh, two cents in this, but I really believe it's not the fault of those uh, employees either. Maybe the next time around, moving forward, maybe everyone's gonna read the policy and understand what has to be done and what when you need to get those submitted to your travel clerk. So I really believe right now today, it's not, uh, employees are not happy because they have never seen the email, only went out to the directors. And some of these directors have not told these employees, otherwise they could have appealed it, is what they're saying. So that's just my two cents. So I'm, I'll motion that once, was that a motion on the floor? Yeah, yeah we already have, yeah. have a motion on the floor. Go ahead, Councilwoman Halverson. Okay, so two things. First is I still haven't got an attorney opinion on the ordinance going backwards from that motion. You know, I'm kind of have a little conflict in this because I'm one of those that, uh, but maybe Georgette, would you respond yeah, to that? Yeah, Georgette. Please? So I don't perceive the ordinance as going backwards the way that it's written. Um, I, I think what you're discussing now of a waiver, the waiver that was offered to review how the policy isn't, wasn't maybe implemented fairly or um, totally is the better way to go rather than add um, where the policy goes backwards. Because I think that that is confusing and it can cause some financial issues. I, you know, I don't know. You know, I think that's a fair point that's been raised about going that far back when you have some of these accounts that are closed out. So, um, but I don't believe that the the actual way that this ordinance is written is that it goes backwards. It does only go forward. And the better way to deal with the previous issues is the waiver. So after that clarification, that 15% won't be going for until this is passed with this motion on the floor. And my second thing is, you know, is this employee, I mean, with a bigger part of the program, was the employee who failed to submit and file those employees' TAs, is, are they getting disciplined? That's a question that I have. And so um, one of the solutions that I did think of is, to give every single employee a travel audit on all their travel expenditures. So
so that they can also be caught up for the last several years because you know it's just too much of a blame game too much pointing fingers of the past at the treasure and um, not knowing this information until t- a couple days ago but the situation ex- especially after hearing mr jacobs on how he was basically um one of those employees who were held differently than other employees that you know he had to submit within two days and now we have employees who go far back as far as 2020 2019 and this um employee that was at finance committee his reports and he found his receipts they were dating back to 2019 and so we were like well how do you how do you not know until 2024 that you're going to be having to pay those back and also you know another question is how do the employees who found those receipts how do they get them wavered and how do they get paid back once that waiver goes through but it needs to be fair it needs to be fair to all employees not just to people who are recently on that list but every single employee needs to have that waiver option Councilman Dreamer. Thank you, Chair. Um, Pigeon, thank you for coming forward. And, um, you know, you're giving us this cat's account- accountability. We don't see that way very much often. Thank you for coming forward. Um, we should have done it as a working session on this. Reading right here, it says travel reports must be submitted by the program director or designee to the town's paralegal department. The program like that, I think we need to take that out and put have everybody on responsible for handling in your own travel, you know, because um, we should have a working session on this and just addressed it because what other programs have a, some more, um, a lot more employees instead of, because the first time I'm hearing something like this happen and the employees are paying for it. Childcare does a good job when they're um, snow, shine, whatever to, provide services to our reservation across our whole reservation are some hard workers. They're committed to the youth. They're committed to what they do. And it's not their fault, you know. So I'll second Sonia's motion on that. If you get a second already because um we I think we do have to have a working session on this to address address this situation and put something here in writing too also that each person is responsible for their own reports and not have it rely on a designee within that program because of this situation like this. So I just want to throw that out there. Thank you, Chair. Councilman Rooks. Yeah, my, my question is, um, if the employees were turning into receipts, are they getting penalized just because they the, the designee yeah. didn't turn into paperwork for them? Yes. You know, that, that that's not fair, you know? It's not the employee's fault. They done what they had to do. They turned into receipts the way they were supposed to, you know? So it falls on a designee who was supposed to do these reports, you know? So the, the employee shouldn't be held account- accountable for something that they've done, you know? They've done what they were supposed to do. When they come back from these travels, I'm pretty sure they get the receipts together and they turn them into the, the higher ups. And it's not the employees that should be getting penalized, you know? Uh, you know, being held accountable, I understand that. And and it's the person that is supposed to be turning these receipts that should be held accountable. But what's what's going to happen to them? Nothing, most likely. They're going to continue going to work while all these employees are getting getting hit hard. You know, that that's finances. This this is, you know, we are the poorest tribe in the United States. You know, we, we are always poor. Yet we're going to hit our employees even harder especially with the program, like, like George says that, you know, they, they work hard every day, you know, and if they have meetings on the weekends, they show up for their meetings on weekends. So, you know, I, if just like Sonia said, you know, I don't think they should, you know, it, it kind of, it's hard, you know, cause it's the employees that are getting hit, uh, you know, it's just upsetting. Thanks. Councilwoman Carlo. I'll pass, Chair. I think we just need to move on. We've been beating this forever, so. Councilman Jumpin' Eagle, and we're going to run the motions. Okay, Chair, I know I know what the motion is, and if we allow every employee to bring their own travel in, that's going to 
put a big burden on them two girls in the office. So if we're going to do that, I think how whoever needs to chief of staff or dean, they need more help in the office. Because by the look of this, they're behind anyway. You know what I mean? So and then what what does Dean's take on all this, Cora? What do you think? Where do you think the push is from? And he's the comptroller. He's in charge of making sure all this stuff, right? Because all the programs need to be in compliance. Because <clears throat> the audits, the the travel is reviewed during the audit. And this this could be a finding. We don't but, know. Because when they test, they pull files. And if that file that they pull doesn't have the report or doesn't have um, an action that they're paying it back or a receipt, Councilman, then Councilman. that's a finding. Well, see, I think, I think that we need to take all of that stuff into consideration before we make a decision. Is there a way that we can this payday is it too late to not take any payments out until we can really sit down and have and discuss this? Is it too late for that to to not penalize on this payday until we we do we do this? I mean, I'm all, I mean I'm agreeable too with the the thirty day extension. I guess we if that if that's gonna happen, then we're stopping all payments now. But just what you said about audits and this and that, whatever decision we make, it affects everything. All the way around, if and if this is a push coming from Dean for those reasons, then I think we really need to consider that too. But I mean, whichever way we go, and I'm getting texts too. We all get texts, and and you know, is this fair to those employees who do turn in their stuff on time? Is it fair to them employees who are, have already been deducted, like Chuck said back in twenty? I don't remember the date he said, but he done paid back a lot. So, I mean, but we want to help however we can, but we don't want to hurt the tribe e either. Okay. The, the last time all of the deductions were started in November, once they were taken out, um, we gave that, uh, um, that timeline for them to appeal. So they went through AP and paid everybody who was deducted, paid them back their deduction. And if we have to do that again, we can do that again. If that's what you guys want to do. And, and, the, and I, you know, pigeons wasn't the only appeal I said no to because of that timeline. I mean, they came in on February 22nd. The deadline was December 20th. So I don't know, I don't know. And then the other guy who was here during finance, he came in the day before she did. And I denied his too, because it was after the date. So if we're going to extend the date, then we need to pull them back too. Yep, everybody I denied since December because there was a few. Yep. Wait, Chair, still going. So those that, if we do the take this action, those that you've, that had appeal and you denied, they, are they going to get reimbursed that money then that they done paid? Yeah. I mean, I think They'll if they are to, that, that'd only be fair. Be the yeah. action that you're going to take because it would be fair and it, it wouldn't be fair to not give them that money back. If we're not going to give it, if we're not going to take money from anyone else, then we need to pay them back too. It's not good for the program. It's not good for trying to follow policy. But and it's good for election time. I was going to say is, you know, we're all going to um, do this because it's election time. We're all scared of not getting reelected and we're trying to please, you know what I mean? It's just, I don't know, it's just, you're following policy, you're following policy. And then we're going to hear some pretty good um, 
campaign speeches from here on out too. Every council meeting. That's what I'm seeing right now. Uh, go ahead, Councilwoman, yeah. and we got to move on. Councilwoman, uh, well, Treasurer uh, Whitehorse knows because she sat in this circle for how many uh, terms and she also was a part of the decision making. But what I want to say today is that um, we do need to give our people a, a time to uh, have the waivers. You know, I've heard today from the director here, two directors, you know, and I think that we just need to be fair to all of our employees. And I think a lot of us in this circle don't need to campaign. I'll tell you that. And I think one thing too, to keep in mind is that, you know, we work for the people and we should be listening to all of them, you know, not just certain ones. And I, I just cannot agree to going back clear to 2019. You know, I've always understood that things ended December 31st of each year, calendar year. So moving, going back, it, I just don't agree with that. And I don't know, you, Tyler had a motion and there was a second to approve the ordinance, but I'm gonna make a motion to table this until we can come back after 30 days to, um, to work on this and uh, to allow for that waiver. So I'm a motion to table ordinance uh, on the, the mod, uh, amending the financial management manual. Okay, so we got a motion by Councilman Little Hawk Weston, second by Councilman Goldspear. Well, it's, I, I don't want to go back to questions because it's going to change, try to change something, and, and we're just going to go backwards. And we had plenty of questions. I counted over 25 people question, with questions. We need to move on. This should have been handled in the committee. So, yes, and she she already made a tabling motion, so we're going to run it. No discussion. Secretary, call for the vote. Wesley Hawkins, Sr. Oh. Jim Meeks. Yes. Brian Jumpenigo, Sr. Yes. Howard Rooks. Yes. Austin Watkins, Sr. Tyler Yellowboy. No. Wendell Youngman, Jr. No. Anna Halverson? Yes. James Cross? Okay. Ella Giancarlo? Yes. George Dreamer Jr.? Yes. Robin Tapio? No. Tyler Lunderman? Yes. David Puyer? Yes. Sonia Lohawk Weston? Ha. Uh, Jackie Sears? Oh, huh. John Ray Gospear? Yes. John Steele Sr. Oh. Garfield Little Dog. Craig Dillon. No. Go ahead, Councilor. Chair. I don't know if this is the right motion, but I'd like to make a motion that we stop the travel deductions at present, because the way I understand it, we tabled this ordinance that was presented, but the other ordinance is still in place where it's gonna keep payroll deducting them people. That's what I wanted to make clear on her tabling motion. Thank you. Okay, let's run this. Uh, My here. other motion was to give them that extension for 30 days. No, that, that was to table this. This ordinance, the one that uh, Tyler made a motion on to, to the fifteen percent, that's the one that we tabled. So no, that's the one we just tabled. That's the one I'm referring to. And so the my motion was to give the extension, the waiver for thirty more days. So that's what the secretary has. Yeah. Okay. So we have eleven yes, six no, one abstain, two not voting. Motion carried. To table. To extend 30 days for a waiver and to Can you? Okay, Sonia. The one you have was a motion by Sonia Little Hawk Weston, second by George Dreamer Jr. to extend uh, to extend 30 day, the 30 days 
for in a waiver or to have in place submit request or an appeal. Okay, so that was a motion by Councilwoman Little Hawk Weston. Second by Councilman Dreamer. Secretary, call for the vote. Wesley Hawkins, Sr. Stain. Jim Meeks. Ryan Jumping Eagle Sr. Yes. Howard Rooks. Yes. Austin Watkins Sr. Tyler Yellowboy. Not voting. Wendell Youngman Jr. Not voting. Anna Halverson. Yes. James Cross. Ella John Carlo. No. Sorry, I didn't hear you. No. George Dreamer Jr. Yes. Robin Tapio. No. Tyler Lunderman. No. David Puyer. Yes. Sonia Lillahawk Weston. Uh. Jackie Sears. Uh huh. John Ray Goldspear. Yes. John Still Sr. Yes. Garfield Little Dog. Craig Dillon. I'm confused. <laughs> No, my vote's no one. Ten yes, three no, one abstain, six not vote uh, voting. Motion carried. I, I believe the treasurer is still going. Thank you. So just to clarify, we will be reimbursing all travel deductions and allowing thirty more days from today for appeals. So tell every single director that you know. Um, one, one thing that I wanted to make note of on, on these is if, if they want their employees to be responsible, then they need to allow them to be responsible. Because if they're not allowing them to submit their own travel reports, then they need to accept that responsibility. And they're not. So that's just a note that I wanted to make. Councilman Puyer. The CEO, executive director, whatever, you're the supervisor, you have to tell her to these program directors, whatever their titles are, they have, she has to make them accountable. Then program directors, nothing is going to be done to them. And look at the staff that works under them. They're the ones that are really suffering over this. Thank you. Right. And, um, okay, so the rest of the packet is, um, that was the big thing. The rest of the packet is all information that we had at finance committee. Go ahead, Councilwoman Halverson. Can can you just explain the day labor process? Because I know our district is kind of yeah. going through a lot with that too. I um I did explain to several districts that I'll be putting out a memo and that at finance committee we did recommend that um it be a uh, joint decision between the tribal council reps and the executive board on the exact process that they will follow.
but they will have to fill out the day labor applications and they will have to select a timekeeper from within that four employees, the supervisor. The supervisor will need to be the timekeeper. But, okay. Councilman, Councilman Puyer, Councilman Gosper, and Councilman Dillon. <laughs> I'll let Councilman hit Dillon. He raised his hand before me. Oh, uh, go my ahead. Motion, my motion is to approve her report after the questions she asks or answers. Okay. So we have a motion by Councilman Dillon, second by Councilman Puyer, and Councilwoman Carlo. Secretary, call for the vote. Wesley Hawkins, Sr. Oh. Jim Meeks. Yes. Ryan Jumpin' Eagle, Sr. Yes. Howard Rooks. Austin Watkins, Sr. Oh. Tyler Yellowboy. Yes. Wendell Youngman, Jr. Yes. Anna Halverson. Yes. James Cross. Ella Giancarlo. Yes. George Dreamer Jr. Robin Tapio. Yes. Tyler Yellowboy. No, I said Tyler Yellowboy. Oh, did you? Oh, I'm sorry, Tyler. <laughs> David Puyer. <laughs> David Puyer. <laughs> Sonia Little Hawk Weston. Sonia. Sonia. Ah. Jackie Sears. Uh huh. Donner Goldspare. Yes. John Steele Sr. Murphy, a little dog. Craig Dillon. Fourteen, 14, yes, six not voting, motion carried. Thank you, Council. Councilman Gosper. Craig, I got one Craig, I got one more question. I got three texts, and people want to know what's going on with energy because they ain't getting paid for wood vending and stuff like that. Cause I mean I don't even I don't even know what to tell them. I mean Um we did finally get a portion of the grant down for specifically for LIAP. And um, Johanna is working with a program director to try and get the payments caught up. Thank you. Okay, so um, I don't know if you wanna continue now or keep continue on or, or break for lunch. Okay, so we'll, we'll break for lunch. It, time is 12.38. We'll resume at around one thirty. Yes, don't go anywhere. We need to do a prayer here. Um, okay. Okay. So, uh, Councilman Dreamer, can you give us a prayer? Thank you, Chair. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, thank you for this day. Thank you for blessing us waking up in the morning. I ask that you bless this food and have that prepared it into nourishments for mind, body, and soul to serve you better spiritually. I ask that you provide for the ones who are having it hard right now, Father, that you just continue to 
Fill them with your love and your grace and mercy upon their life. Give you thanks today. Amen. Okay, one thirty. Resume. Recording stopped.